evening, everyone. Welcome to the April 12th uh, Planning Commission work session. Uh, so we'll start off with a short notice uh, pursuant to the governor's executive orders 1634, 5160, 6571, and 78, and the need to limit the community spread of COVID-19. Members of the Planning Commission will participate by electronic means, and the meeting will be live streamed to protect the public health, safety, and welfare of the members and the city citizens of Gallatin. So with that, we'll get started. Marianne, would you please call the roll? And if everyone would uh, vote that you're in attendance and that you agree to hold the meeting electronically. Vice Chair Harris. Uh, present and approved. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Uh, present and approved. Councilwoman Love. Present and approved. Dr. Orgain. Mr. Strouther. Present and approved. Ms. Hibbler. Present and approved. Okay, passes, uh, let's see, five zero. Uh, with that, we will uh, move forward into the first item on the agenda, which is Winsong phase 2C and 2D. And then uh, see Winsong, this final master development plan and the Winsong preliminary plat. Who's representing this? And you want to talk about both items as at once? Uh, Jillian Ogden, staff planner. And yes, I will talk about both items. The applicant requests approval of a finer mass of development plan and preliminary plat for Winsong phases 2C and 2D. Next slide, please. Winsong is located at the intersection of Southwater Avenue and Highway 109. Uh, phases 2A and 2B were recently approved and will be under construction soon. Next slide, please. These two residential phases include 32 single family lots, 132 attached single family lots, and 16 open space tracks with public streets and public and street trees. Next slide, please. If you could just run through these slowly, Dustin, they just go through the plan. The FMDP and preliminary plat are consistent with the approved PMDP. We are in discussions with the applicant about the best final placement of the natural walking trail that will be an amenity to the subdivision, but otherwise with some minor corrections throughout the two documents, these items will be ready for planning commission vote in two weeks. And I'm happy to answer any other questions you might have. Okay. Um, are there, as far as from staff, is there, are there any major concerns or feedback that you guys have given the applicant that they need to address other than the walking trails? Um, I don't believe so. There were some corrections with making sure lot sizes were correct, um, but everything is pretty consistent with the most recent version of the PMDP. Okay. Um, do we have a representative of the applicant that wishes to add anything? Um, can y'all hear me? Yeah, Sam. Yeah, this is Sam Chrisman with Reagan Smith. Um, and we have, we have no additional concerns and are going to work with staff on the review comments. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, does anyone else have any, any comments or questions for staff or for the applicant? Since I'm new, I just want to make sure that I understand what we're doing. This this has already all been approved by city council and planning, hasn't it? It has, yes. This is the, the PMDP already went through. So this is the final master development plan and the preliminary plat. So they just would mirror what was approved at previous versions. So there's no changes? No. Okay, thank you, Jillian. All right, well, if there's... No further comments. Uh, thank you, everybody. We'll see you back in a couple of weeks and we'll move on to agenda item number three. So that was agenda one and two at the same time. So agenda three is Dutch Brothers Coffee amended preliminary master development plan and final master development plan. Uh, looks like Dustin's got this one. So uh, go ahead. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So um, this is an amended PMDP slash FMDP for Dutch Brothers Coffee. Um, it's located south of Nashville Pike and east of Browns Lane. 
it's a Lowe's out parcel piece of property. Um, so they're amending the Lowe's master plan. Uh, it should be a minor amendment. And it's they're doing an FMDP for a walk-up slash drive-through coffee shop. It's going to be a 975-square-foot building. Uh, the lot is 1.19 acres. It's zoned PGC. Um, as you can see, there's going to be dual drive-through lanes um, and then pretty extensive sidewalk to connect to the existing sidewalk for walk-up customers. Um, they are providing the required parking. There's not much required based on the square footage. Their bioretention and uh, stormwater handling capabilities will be located, as you see in green on the screen. Okay. Um, their landscaping, uh, there, there's some easement challenges with a sanitary sewer easement along Nashville Pike. Um, I'm still working with the applicant to maybe put some shrubs up here, like we've seen in other um, submittals where they have that challenge, and just to work through all the PGC required landscaping, which is pretty extensive. Um, the elevations do meet the brick and stone requirements, as you can see. And that, that concludes uh, my presentation. And, uh, we have a representative from the applicant. Sam, is that gonna be you again? Or if there's someone else from Reagan Smith? Um, that's Cole, uh, Cole Wigger. He, I believe he's on, um, yes. you may just need to. Okay, yep, I got on. him. Thank you, uh, Sam. Cool, yeah. Yeah, this is Cole Wigger with Reagan Smith Associate, uh, Associates located at 315 Woodland Street in Nashville. Uh, yeah, we, we agree with all comments that staff have uh, provided um, to Dustin's previous comment. We're working with him to get the landscape buffers um, up to code and happy to answer any other questions you have. It's, are, is the landscaping buffer, is that is that really the major item you guys need to work through on this one everything else is 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 good yeah that that was the main thing i identified i think uh engineering stormwater didn't really have too many concerns um so it was mainly the landscaping what was in the lowe's master development plan what was what was on this parcel before um that's that's making the suggestion that'd be a minor and then that is similar circulation and use just a different type of building yeah i think it was kind of i have to go back and look exactly at the wording but i, I seem to remember it was kind of like either uh retail or food service or okay. in, in that vein yeah that that's correct there wasn't a layout provided in that master development plan okay all right but but the but the type of use for the out parcel this this is consistent so it, it shouldn't it, should, it, it doesn't sound like it needs to be a major amendment so, right. Okay. Did you say right. this is a drive through only? It's drive through and walk up. Okay, but you cannot go inside, right? Yeah, Cole, is that correct? You, there's no indoor seating. Correct. Yes, no indoor yeah. seating. Okay. Okay. Interesting. All right. Uh, does any of the members of the Planning Commission have any questions for staff or the applicant before we move this on? Sure. Nope. All right. Well, sounds pretty straightforward. We'll see you back in a couple of weeks. All righty. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. So moving on, uh, item four is McCain's station amended preliminary master development plan. And uh, in the McCain stations phase lots one, four through five is, is item five. You staff want to work both of these together or do you want to separate the discussion? These will be separate. All right, we'll do separate. So we do item four first. Go ahead, Julian. Yes, uh, next slide, please. The applicant requests approval of an amendment to the preliminary master development plan for McCain Station, a mixed use development. Next slide, please. McCain Station is located at the intersection of Highway 386 and Big Station Camp Boulevard. Next slide, please. I'm going to bring up the color elevate the color drawings. So this is the uh, requested amendment. And next slide, please. And this is what was previously approved. So 
very minor changes here. So if you go back to the amendment, please. Yes, um, changes include the reconfiguration of some of the residential lots, rephasing of the overall project with some renumbering of commercial lots, an additional write in write out for our par out parcel two, rerouting of the walking path. Um, it's not shown on the newest version, but I did have a conversation with the applicant today about um, reconfiguring that uh, through the open spaces and through our stormwater areas so that we have it um, so it's consistent throughout the development and adding some sign locations. Some of these changes, specifically the flipping of the cul-de-sac in the middle of the residential development was approved with the final master development plan for phase one and is shown here for consistency. The larger components such as density, architecture, street layout, et cetera, uh, will not be changing. So at, these at this time, after uh, staff review, these changes appear to be minor, uh, just to kind of clean it up and keep the PMDP consistent as the development moves through the process. Okay. Uh, do we have a representative for the applicant that wants to weigh in? Uh, yeah, this is Wes McGill with Reagan Smith. Uh, we're in agreement with staff comments. We would like to discuss a couple of those with the planning commissioner members and the staff as well. Um, there's two comments that uh, we would like to discuss. One is um, related to the proposed entrances on our parcel three. Um, staff had suggested that we move those two entrances um, further to the south, so close to the stream buffer. Uh, we are in agreement with that, but would also request that we add an additional um, entrance into the lot six, the potential retail that would line up with this. That there's a shared access drive between out parcel two and three. Um, so we, we want to be able to add a, another entrance there just to uh, account for any future subdivisions of that lot. Wes, when you're when you're when you're saying add another entrance, are you talking about um, on your road or another connection to Big Station Camp? Uh, it's going to be on the internal road. On the internal road, okay. Yeah. And there's there's actually already one there that was removed. Uh, we just need to move it into a different location, essentially. Okay. Um, so, question. For staff, does does that cause any concerns for for you guys, or is that is that okay? This is Brian with engineering. I don't think that's an issue for us as long as things line up. That should be fine. Okay, All right. that sounds good. And Wes, you said you had a what was the second item? I don't. That one doesn't sound like it's going to be a problem. Okay, great. Um, yeah, started with the easier one first. I guess. <laughs> uh, the the second comment was. You know, we had had some walking trails that were kind of shown throughout the development on the original PMDP. And then as you all have seen with the final master development plans for the phase one residential section, we did not include those walking trails that goes between uh, the home lots and, and behind the home lots, uh, mainly just from a grading and, and drainage standpoint, most of those areas are gonna be used for stormwater management. And so what the, uh, the owner would like to do is, is have a walking trail that's part of the green space stream buffer common area. There's a seven acres there roughly on the, the bottom of the sheet. Uh, he's gonna have, have a, the walking trail go through there. That's gonna have some um, uh, trailheads associated with it. And then and we would, also add a future connection to the uh, city parks that's uh, proposed in the future for along the TVA easement. Uh, and then the internal trails throughout the development, you know, behind the, the single family homes and townhomes, uh, we would not construct, but instead focus our efforts on, on the amenity areas with the walking trails. Um, staff, can you guys maybe point a cursor? Where was the walking trail on the preliminary plan that that's yeah. being? Uh, help help me understand where that was at. I don't. Yeah, Dustin, if you could go to the approved PMVP, the next slide you had up. So you can see the brown. I don't know if you can zoom in at all, but there are brown trails that go 
kind of along the stream buffers behind some of these lots. Yeah, especially through where the cursor is right now. There's, I think that's the one where they want to add that back in is right along this stream buffer. But you can see these brown trails are the natural trails that were going to be an amenity uh, throughout this development. Now, I did have a conversation with Reagan Smith this afternoon, um, and they did reiterate wanting to add back in the walking path in the stream buffer area, right where that high density residential is. Um, yeah, right in that area, they were going to add that one back in <clears throat> and then connect into the future park on the left side of this page. But the trails that they show right next to single family homes, they would rather use their sidewalk network than another greenway path because they do have, I mean, they have sidewalks on both sides of the street. Um, it's mostly developed. It's not quite as open. So um, I believe that's what they intend to do with their resubmittal. Okay, so that, so we're not so there's there's adequate connectivity through the development through the sidewalk network. It sounds like yes. I mean, we'd have to see for sure with the resubmittal. I definitely wanted um, the city planners input on it once we saw that, um, but but that is something we'll be looking for. Okay. Hey, Wes, it was what what changed or is there what's is what's I guess what's driving the removal of the of those greenway trails? Did, did something change in the and the topography when you guys got into this or just help me there understand. It is, yeah, I mean, that's exactly one of the main reasons was the topography challenges and then the stormwater management, you know, on the original PMDP, we hadn't really put pencil to paper on design yet. And just when we started getting to design, there's a lot of gray change. And most of these areas that, that had the walking trails in it are being utilized for stormwater management and swales and stuff. Uh, so we wanted to still keep it in as part of the plan, but focus kind of more of the amenity areas. Uh, like Jillian said, we're going to leave it in that green space buffer area. Uh, that's where the high density residence is. But we may end up moving that over to the other side of the stream just to get it away from any of the development. So it really feels more like a, a green ray trail rather than a walking path on the backside of a, a you know, high density development. Got it. Got it. Now that that makes sense. Um, does anybody, any other members of the planning commission, have any any questions or or con concerns for the applicant or for staff that would help? Not, not just the greenway. That was. Thank you. Okay. So, um, I I looked at this in a little more depth today, and I guess for. Kind of everybody's understanding some you know it's not uncommon on some of these developments when you do preliminary development plans not to have all of the topography data until you clear the land so it's not uncommon sometimes to get into these and what you thought would work didn't work but i i personally i'm just one boat i don't have a i don't see a problem with, especially if we're adding we have plenty of connectivity to the sidewalks and where you've got common area greenway trails and some of the that's still there in the neighborhood i'm I don't, I don't see any major hangups here. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, if nobody else has any comments, we'll go on to uh, item five, which is again, McCain station lots one, phase one lots four and five final plat. Okay. So, um, okay. So um, basically exact, same uh, location, big station camp north of 386. Um, this is just dealing with particularly lots four and five, the final plat. Um, as you can see, um, it it matches what was approved with the master plan. And we're just making sure um, through this process that um, we make, we, we get this coordinated with what we're doing on the previous item. Uh, so if, if, if that's done and some of our other comments are addressed, there shouldn't be any issues. Okay. Uh, what, what other comments did you have that, that might be something we need to know about for our, our meeting in a couple of weeks? Um, the ours were basically just almost, um, clerical, you know, just issues like extending, extend this part of the road to, um, the edge of this, just, uh, just for cleanliness. <laughs> The cleanness of the lines, I guess, or um, just a few labeling issues here and there. 
So nothing, nothing, uh, design really oriented. Okay. Engineering may have, may have had a couple other comments. I don't know if they want to chime in, but that was basically for us. Okay. Uh, now engineering, is there any other comments for it that you guys have on this? No, ours were basically cosmetic in nature. There was a site plan associated with lot five. We had to have that deferred, but this plat can go forward as far as we're concerned. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, then Wes, I'm assuming you're representing this for the owner as well. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, just like Dustin said, most of them are clerical, so we're, we're in agreement with everything. Um, we'll make sure it matches the, the PMDP revisions and lines up with that. The only thing I did want to point out is the sweep wire way construction or the limits of construction that were shown on this is per the approved uh, FMDP that was part of the phase one commercial. Okay. Um, so those improvements are going to hold back to that level until we can get a stream um, crossing approved, which is going to occur later. Uh, but we will go ahead and extend the right of way and show the extension of, of that road as a, a future for lot four. Okay, I see. So you're talking right there at the end of the road where that the L6 line data stops that's, right there. That's correct, yes. Okay. And is that is that is that just because you are you do you feel like you're gonna need to turn the road or do something different with it to cross the stream in the future? Is that why you don't want to go ahead and construct it? Or uh, we don't need to do anything different with it. It's just in the in the phase one plans that were for these two lots. We we stayed out of the stream buffer un, until we until we wanted to cross the stream, which is going to be important. Okay. okay, that that makes sense. Uh, any anyone else have any questions for the applicant or any clarification on anything on this item? Okay. Seeing none, I appreciate it. We'll see you guys back in a couple of weeks and we will move on to item six, vintage Baker's Crossing Apartments, final master development plan. And looks like Jillian has got this one. So yes. please go ahead. Yes, next slide, please. The applicant requests approval of a final master development plan for the vintage Baker's Crossing Apartments, a 252 unit apartment complex located on Tulip Poplar across from the new Hilton. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the land that we will be talking about this evening. Next slide, please. The layout and architecture are consistent with the PMDP. Um, Dustin, if you just wanna kind of run through these slides, this is a very similar layout to what was, a, what was shown on the PMDP that you guys saw in November um, yeah. with the one connection to Tulip Poplar um, with buffer yards. Next slide. The architecture also meets and or exceeds the 70% brick requirement, and there was a height exception already approved with this PMDP. Let me pull up the elevation. So this is what was shown for the elevations for the PMDP. And then if you can run through the next few elevation slides, this is the iteration that we have today. Um, for uh, these elevations. So the fronts along Tulip Poplar will actually be only two story. And then it goes down into um, three story buildings as it goes into the development because this land sits lower than the road. Yeah, so sorry, just to interrupt. Can you go back a couple of slides just so everybody can see the two story front elevation? There you go. Yeah, that's it right there. The one in the middle, okay. So, so if, you're, if you're driving down Tulip Poplar, that's the elevation you'll see, it'll look more like a two-story building or two-story house, not a three-story apartment building. This Correct. Time. Yes. Okay. Yes. And that was the plan with the PMDP as well. That was, I, that yeah. was I remember talking about it. It's just been more than 24 hours ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, we'll have connections to the public street to these units. Um, I think it'll go really well with Preston Park and the Hilton Garden Inn um, with this style that they're showing. Um, Dustin, if you could go back to one of the uh, showing the overall site, uh, just to bring something up there. Yeah, go, okay, right here. So um, the owner has also approached the city about possibly donating five to eight acres of land for a public park. Uh, this land is located along Nashville Pike. So um, Dustin, if you could kind of circle the 
like rectangle right along note to your left yeah that piece and then up through where the floodway is along the west side of that property um the donation would not affect the density of the project since the 252 units are approved but we would just want to document um, all of that appropriately. We have been in talks with the Parks and Recreation Department on the possibilities of a park at this location and future maintenance costs. Um, City Council would have to make the final decision on any acceptance of, of a donation of that kind, but we just wanted to bring it to your attention that that was a possibility. It was something that was being talked about. Um, right. Otherwise, this uh, FMDP is consistent with its PMDP. Thank you. Right. Uh, we have a representative for the applicant that would like to weigh in. It's either uh, Greg Harris, I believe. Uh oh. Gosh, do we have anybody? It looks like they're wanting to speak on this for the applicant. Everything is frozen on my computer for a moment. Uh, let me see if I can get this fixed. Okay. Yeah, it looks like it just came back. Okay. All right. Uh, Gina, I know, is the project architect, and I believe Greg Harris is the project engineer. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you've yeah. both been unmuted. Okay, go ahead, Greg. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, this is Greg Harris with Enfield Construction Engineering. Um, Gina pretty much laid everything out. We are, uh, we've worked through the, uh, our, the letter of, uh, of recommendations and review from the city and really haven't found anything that, that we're not able to, uh, to accommodate. Uh, been in discussions with the uh, engineering department on some things regarding uh, East Camp Creek and uh, Highway 31 and uh, you know, the water surface elevations there. Uh, also been talking with uh, Mr. McCord about the uh, development within the floodplain, and again, the, uh, the donation for the park and how all that would work with respect to to uh, easements across that is required uh, for our project. So um, that, you know, feel like that's moving forward so far. Okay. Oh, sounds good. Does, does anyone have any, any questions about this project? And I'll just remind the rest of the, our commission members, this, this, these are apartments that have already been approved. So we're, we're, not, we're not approving new apartments in the city of Gallatin. This has already been and done. We're just working on the final, the uh, the final master development plan at this stage. These were approved years ago. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, this apartments were approved on this parcel. Um, goodness, back. I, I don't. Somebody could probably know more than me, but you know, prior to the housing crash in 07, 08, and this is set there, and and so this uh, the number of units. I believe is either exactly or very similar to what was approved back years ago. So this is a this is a project that started well, you know, more than ten years ago. That's just now you know coming coming to reality. So thanks. thanks. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, it's Bill. Can you can you talk to what's what are there concerns with the development of the floodway that you see being an issue or things that we need to know about or is it minor or something that you guys are working through? I don't think there's any issues that are not surmountable. The uh, applicant had mentioned that they were looking to donate a portion of the property, roughly this uh, somewhat similar to the area outlined in red there, but okay. all of the floodway would be part of property donated to the city and parts of the flood plain, which is the zone AE, and a little bit of actually the zone X, which is outside the 100 year flood zone. The back portions of the, what I'll call the back of the westerly buildings are still located in the flood plain, but they're going to do some uh, grade changes there. And they were working uh, with FEMA to file what will eventually be a letter of map amendment to elevate those areas out of the floodplain without adversely affecting other properties in the area. So um, what, they'll, what they show is some uh, uh, detention basins on another, on another slide there. There's, they showed some of the detention basins. Those will be located in the floodplain, but they could be removed from the floodplain as well. So 
Yeah, this one shows it retention, bioretention area two. Uh, so we're working with them in concert with uh, their potential donation to make sure that uh, they have appropriate easements for uh, any uh, conveyances for stormwater, for example, or other utilities. The retention areas themselves will remain on their property and right. essentially they'll carve out around the areas that would normally be required for their buffer zone for the donation to the city. And uh, of course, our greenway system, this is a key area in our greenway system. It's kind of the crux of the whole greenway system where it intersects right there under the railroad trestle. So that'll be important to ensure that, that we have adequate room uh, to be able to provide for the that in any area within the park donation area instead of in a narrowly confined corridor. So that will be a bit, big benefit to the city, uh, mutually beneficial. And the last thing that kind of goes along that with that is that we were going to ensure that um, if approved by the city that um, uh, any density credits that are allocated to or restricted because of the development of the site, uh, all of the density credit for the city property, what, what will be the city of property will be afforded to this development site. So if there's a zoning change that establishes a certain density per acre, they will be able to take advantage of the full acreage of the property that's being donated by, uh, to the city to meet their density requirements. Although they're not proposing any changes to their plan, they're still limited at 252 units. So it really shouldn't be an issue. It's just uh, to ward off any concern that we might have if, if changes occur in the zoning or the comp plan that relate to that. Yeah, um, sounds sounds good. Maybe uh, good for the city to get a park. So um, I, the only other comment I have on this is actually uh, a thank you in a way. You know, we had a lot of conversations when we were revisiting this project about repaving on Tulip Poplar Road. So. I know the engineering and I think the, the developer, the owners work some things out there. So um, thanks to everyone who made sure that road got paved and, and got repaired over the winter. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Any, any other members of the commission have questions, concerns, feedback for the applicant? All right, well, hearing none, we'll see this back in a couple of weeks and we'll move on to um, item seven which is Triple Brook rezoning with preliminary master development plan. Um, Dustin Shane. Yes, sir. So um, this is a rezoning with the PMDP uh, presented by Clover Engineering Services. And this is uh, back to you all after being redesigned. Uh, it was here, I think, last month. Um, it's located, it's kind of cut off here um, at the top of the screen. Let's see if I can. Um, it's on North Water on the west side, right across from a. There's a little commercial strip there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so currently there is one single family home on this site. Um, it's a 0.87 acre uh, parcel. And the home is somewhat historic. I think it looks like it's older than it is. It, it was actually built in the fifties, but it, uh, it's a Tudor style home. Um, they're proposing to re subdivide this uh, piece of property, resubdivide it and put three more single family homes on it uh, with outlets on the North water and Trimble Avenue. The front half of this is currently MRO and the back half, half is CG commercial general. So that's one thing they're proposing with this is to rezone the entire thing to MRO, uh, which which is supported by the comp plan. Um, this access on the Trimble in the rear, um, we're proposing that they uh, do away with this connection here and improve Trimble uh, with the current the current design of it uh, all the way to this point here, so that this this house will have an outlet onto onto a public right of way. Um, there's also a question we have about cars backing into the road. Um, if there's any provision maybe for turnaround or how that will be handled. 
Um, this is the architecture that they're proposing. So they are requesting a exception to the brick or stone requirement. Um, I'm assuming that's uh, cement, si cementitious siding, um, board and batten here on the on the gable. So pretty pretty close in line with what we're seeing in a lot of re current residential construction. Josh, do you see anybody raising their hand wanting to speak on this? If you are uh, the engineer of record or the architect of record for Triple Brook PMDP uh, or developer, please use the raise your hand function at the bottom of the screen. It'll let me know to unmute you so that you can uh, address the planning commission. Here we go. I've got Kyle Schneider. Kyle, your line is unmuted. Kyle, can you can you hear us? All right, Josh, it seems Kyle's not there. So, um, well, I guess we'll go ahead and give some feedback. If, if Kyle happens to pop up while we're still on the topic, we'll be glad to hear his, hear his comments. Um, the, uh, what I guess we talked about the extension of Trimble Avenue for the, the connections on the driveways. What, what type of street is that now, as far as a right of way, curb and gutter, is it, what, what type of roads there already? It's pretty minimal engineering. Do you want? Was somebody out there to see it? Um, it's it's pretty. It doesn't meet current standards. I know. Yeah, it's it's 38 feet of right of way. Uh, the pavement width is substandard. Um, but obviously, we are utilizing it for trash pickup, and the post office is using it for mail delivery. So, our thought was just to go ahead and have them match what's out there, extend it past that northerly uh, lot so that they don't have to create an access through a property to service that that building. Okay. So with, so with the, the extension of Trimble Lane, as far as the, the width of the, the drive or the road be similar to what they're putting in for a driveway anyway? Or is it going to be a little wider? Uh, yeah, it's probably... Okay, we got Kyle on now. Oh, yeah, sorry about yeah. that. No, nope, not a not a problem, but by all means good. Glad to hear your thoughts. Uh, yep, yep, yeah. So um I know originally um we originally had the four quadplexes in the back and uh kind of scrapped that due to having to kind of extend Trimble a little more than budgetary would have allowed. Um but uh, as it is now, Trimble is it kind of dead ends almost. It kind of turns up into the property there in the west. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's probably only 12, 15, maybe 18 feet wide. Uh, um, so, I mean, we can extend it um, pretty much how we have it shown, just push it west. Yeah. Um, I think that it's probably a little better for the that northwest lot anyways, ha having the right away entrance instead of the shared easement. Yeah, so they just 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 looking at it, I don't. It seems like your your the amount of concrete you're pouring is going to be roughly the same, and would probably help you on that that last piece anyway. It might be an improvement for you when you sell it. So, yep. So, okay. and then I think I think we have the room to put in a turnaround um, on the Water Avenue side if that's if that's what would be uh, preferred by the planning staff yeah i think sort of for for staff or engineers that i guess what you're asking for on the on the water side is you know the driving configuration as such someone could could back in and turn a car around and not not be back in right on the north water yeah actually that was a planning comment but that's a good comment i mean just just for safety and to reduce conflict right. of potential accidents that's that's good okay. 
and the applicant you guys are open to open to that yeah i don't think it would um i mean it's not gonna greatly affect anything it's uh what 200 square feet of concrete yeah. overall not that much okay right. and then uh just going back um from from staff so the the rezoning to mro says consistent with the comp plan so there's no concerns there yeah the the zoning doesn't match the comp plan in a lot of this area right around the railroad yeah um so the comp plan was obviously trying to get at turning this in the direction of MRO. So it, it it's in line with those goals. Okay. Uh, and then question going kind of architecture and I'm, I'm forgive me, I'm not familiar with that particular street, but the surrounding architecture is from a, from a standpoint of what's, what's around that neighborhood, what, what type of, of architecture is around there? Is it primarily siding? Is it brick? How has anybody out there looked at it? Pretty eclectic um, from what I've seen. So a mix of different materials. Um, I, I don't think this would stand out based okay. on what's around it. Okay. I don't know. You said the other one is a Tudor styles, which doesn't sound like it's anything like these. That's correct, uh, Councilwoman Love. It is uh, Tudor and it, it, it has more, I think, brick uh, exterior. Um, but you only have to go a street or two or a house or two the other direction. And then you've got some, some different siding and different, uh, styles going on. So in that sense, it seems like there's, there's a pretty good mix, um, in the area. We, we will get photographs of the other types of architecture that is applied to homes in that area for the regular meeting. Um, yeah, that, that sounds good. My, probably my only architecture comment and we've, We've addressed this on request to deviate from brick and use more siding, whether it's cementitious or not, is some type of water table wainscot where you've got a brick or a stone to grade um, just for maintenance. The lawnmowers and things aren't beating up the houses over time. So that would be a suggestion I'd have for you. So, all right, does anybody else have any feedback for the applicant on this item? All right, well, hearing none, we'll see you back in a couple of weeks and we'll move on to uh, item eight, Cumberland Point phase two, which is a uh, final plat. Okay, yes, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I've got Cumberland Point phase two, their final plat. Uh, it is for, there's 50 townhome lots on here and some open spaces. Of course, they've already had their PMDPs, uh, preliminary plats, and all that's already been done. This is just the the final to go ahead and get it recorded. Okay. It's, this is the area. It's right across from where Meadow Glen is on Red River Road, across the road from it. Okay. Uh, do we have a representative for the applicant? Sorry. Hi, yes, this is, hi, this is uh, Brad Snyder with uh, CFDG. Um, we are in agreement with all of uh, staff comments, so we're just here to answer any questions. Okay. Um, so Sharon, is this, is this consistent with what's already been approved? So or is there any, any, any significant changes to we should be aware of? No, it, it's consistent with the, everything that has been approved. Most of our comments on them were mostly just superficial little clerical errors, errors and things like that. That's all. All right. That sounds good. All right. Uh, does anybody else have any comments or feedback? So all, all the Cumberland Point phases have already been approved by council? Is that uh, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. All right, sounds good. All right, if nobody else has anything else, uh, we'll see this back in a couple of weeks. Seems fairly just procedural. And we will move on to item nine, Newman's Crossing, phase two, final plat uh, insurance. Okay, uh, Newman's Crossing is pretty much the same thing as everything else has already been approved. This is the final plat for 
uh, this particular phase 2A. This is down, it's off of station, big station camp. And this is just another final plat. There's going to be, I think, approximately 50 more uh, townhomes on this one. So, that, not a lot of significant comments were on this one either. They do have some stormwater uh, agreements they have to sign and things like that. Well, it sounds good. Uh, do you have a representative for the applicant on this item? Uh, this is Brad Snyder again with uh, CSEG. And uh, same thing, we're in agreement with all of the staff comments and we'll get those addressed. Well, sounds good. So this so sounds like it's like the previous item that's consistent and pretty, pretty straightforward. Does anyone have any, any other comments or feedback for the applicant? Well, seeing none, we'll see you back in a couple of weeks. Thanks. All right, moving on, we'll go to item 10, which is Westfield Apartments amended preliminary master development plan and final master development plan. Yes, uh, Jillian Ogden, staff planner. Next slide, please. The applicant requests approval of an amended preliminary master development and plan and final master development plan for the Westfield Apartments, a 284 unit apartment complex located on Big Station Camp Boulevard. Next slide, please. Uh, this was the approved PMDP. You can see the apartments on the left side of your of your screen. Uh, changes from the PMDP include an, uh, an update on the overall layout. Next slide, please. Uh, which actually creates more usable open space, almost like almost like shared courtyards. Uh, so the layout changes actually seem to be uh, very positive for this development. The plan also shows a 50 foot buffer with a berm along the railroad tracks. Uh, that's along the north side here. Uh, the PMDP showed 60 feet. They are showing 50 feet now, um, but th they both exceed the requirement of only 20 feet. So staff doesn't believe that's a huge issue. Um, the FMDP also indicates with the submittal, it was 288 units versus the 284 units approved. So this would either need to be changed by the applicant or amended. Um, and I believe the applicant will address that tonight. Next slide, please. Go through a couple of these showing the overall layout. They are going to add a parking area in the back for RVs and boats, which is which is pretty um, a, a nice amenity. Next slide, please. Stormwater. And then these next few sides are the landscaping plan, um, showing all the detailings around the buildings and in the bio ponds as well. Um, the berms along the railroad tracks are actually mostly constructed at this point. Um, but they will serve as that buffer. And then as for the architecture, which should be coming up. Okay, so um, the architecture for the PMDP, these are what we've seen for previous iterations of these apartments. So the one on the top of your screen was when if you'll recall, these apartments were kind of technically moved from a previous section of Kennesaw Farms into Westfield. So the one on this top slide was the original iteration of the apartments when they were in Kennesaw Farms. The version on the, on the bottom of the screen is when the Westfield PMDP went through. Um, they neither one met the Brickstone requirement. They did get an exception approved. Um, there wasn't any details to that, but they they don't have to meet the requirement based on these versions and based on that's the previous iterations. So the app, the architecture that they did provide, next slide please, um, is they have three iterations of this model with the stone as well as hardy board. Um, the elevations on the screen, let's see, I wanna make sure you guys see all these. If you could go through these next three slides to show the different variations. So the planning commission would need to determine if the architecture is consistent with the PMDP, if you guys are comfortable with, with these layouts, um, since we don't have to meet the brick stone requirement in this instance, but I want to make sure that you guys think it's consistent with the previous approval. 
Uh, and then Dustin, I think there's a version at the end with some actual photographs. Yes, so these are some photographs provided of, of what the overall look is. Um, another thing with the elevations, the PMDP did not include an exception to the 35 foot height allowance in MU zoning. Um, and of these three building models, they do exceed that requirement uh, between two and four feet is what they would need an additional two or four feet um, uh, as they exceed that 35 feet. The applicant would need to request an exception for this height, height allowance and the planning commission would need to term, determine if this change is acceptable. So for this item, uh, well, big ticket items are the unit count, having a discussion about that, the height exception um, and the architecture. I will say for the height exception, they are kind of sitting lower than the road and it all is along railroad tracks and other parts of the development. So I don't think the height would be a, a negative impact to um, existing things in the area. Uh, so that is something to take into account. Um, and then I do believe the applicant is here to address any questions. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, do we have a representative for the applicant with us this evening? Yes, Cal Gentry with Southeastern Building. Cal, good evening. Thank you. I, I want to run through the four points that uh, Jillian brought up. Um, number one being the unit count. We are actually, we are only going to have the 284 units that were approved previously. We will have four model units that will not be for rent, not able to be occupied, um, just to round out the architecture um, so the building footprints don't have to change and so that they can have um, models, floor plans that they can show perspective, perspective uh, tenants. So, uh, and we can handle that however you like, just with the approval, or um, if we need to have a, a different restriction, we can handle that, but we are only gonna have the 284 units. Um, and uh, Matt, I'm not sure if you wanna handle these points one at a time, or if you'd like for me to go through all four. Um, no, go ahead, go through all four, and then we'll, we'll circle back to them. Okay, on the building height, Julian covered that really well. Really, the reason they're a little higher than the 35 feet is we want nine foot uh, ceilings in all the units just to make them a lot nicer. And we feel like because of our location where we sit, that shouldn't be an issue. Um, the building exteriors, uh, actually, you know, when we saw these units, we liked them so much that we, we brought them in and, and, and decided to use this architecture. It's, it's what's, what's called a contemporary Tennessee farmhouse. If you'll remember when you drive around in the country, you see a lot of homes, old white clapboard homes with the limestone um, foundations. That's what it's trying to emulate. Um, we had a bunch of old barns on the front of Kennesaw uh, when we first started this project out here. Some of them were red, but we had an old white barn. So that's what we're trying to do with this architecture is just kind of tie it back into the countryside and the landscape that it's coming out of. Um, lastly, on the railroad buffer width, um, like Jillian said, we had 60 on the preliminary master. We've since built the, the berm through that area along the railroad track and only needed the 50 feet. Um, it's actually in place under a separate approval. So uh, those are the four, um, the four points we just want to discuss with you guys tonight. Uh, does anyone have any questions for the applicant or for staff on any of those points? All right. um, I guess, Cal, how, do you, how would you guys propose restricting, you know, if we allow the, the four additional units to be used as models, how do we, how do we have assurance they stay models and don't become rentals? Yeah, I mean, Matt, of course we would honor the approval you guys give us, but we've talked with our attorney as well. And there's a simple restriction we can place on the four units that are selected for model units that would track with the title of the land and could be enforceable by the city. Okay. Okay. I, and is that, you know, so the four units, I think you said is, is that being driven by the architecture of the buildings? Just well, it's, it's not worked it's, out. Yeah. It's, it's twofold. One, it, it really makes it a lot easier to take, um, Respective tenants through if you've got some units closer to the clubhouse and the amenities. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, you don't end up with a building that looks cut off or different from the other buildings. It just rounds it out. Everything in, in this site is kind of on, on a basis of 12 units, right. uh, which would be 288. But 
having the 284 for rent and then just the four models helps round out the architecture, make it look right. Okay. All right. But that, that, that makes sense. My, you know, my, my feedback on the, on the architecture and brick stone, you know, obviously we, we're not requiring the compliance at 70% brick, but I like to point out that the architecture looks really good and it's not saving you any money because the amount of stone you've got on these buildings, you could have, you probably could have bricked the entire buildings for what you're spending on the stone, I would imagine. Yeah, we agree. But it's this product, it looks fantastic on the ground. Um, and we, we just, we really want to replicate that here. We think it'll, it'll look really, really good in this location. I, I, I agree with that. So, um, and then the, the height, the height variance, you know, given the location of where this is at, I, I personally don't see any problem with okay. that. It's, you know, it's, it's about, we're talking about, a, you know, next to the railroad tracks and sitting down below the grade. If this was, you know, right on Nashville pipe, sitting up higher on the ground, it might be a different conversation, but given the location, I, this is my personal opinion and welcome to any feedback anybody else has, if anybody has an opinion on it. I know I keep asking, but has this already come to city council? Yes, yeah, so Westfield has included apartments when the preliminary master development plan came through. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and Councilman Love and Julian can correct my recollection. This it was a, this was a trade off. There were apartments that had been approved in Kennesaw, and they removed them from that development plan and kind of swapped them over to this property. So this wasn't a it wasn't an increase in the number of apartment units coming to Gallatin. It was it was moving some that had been approved elsewhere. And quite frankly, this is a better location for them, in my opinion. I that is, that's I remember, correct. Sorry, I remember doing that. I just didn't remember. I didn't recognize the name Westfield. So yes, I do, I do remember doing that swap though. Yes. Thank you. Okay, um, Jillian. Are there any other is engineering or? You know, are there any other, any concerns or, or things you guys are working through the applicant that would be good for us to know at this stage before we see it back in a couple of weeks? Um, those were our big ticket items. So those were the things I wanted you to talk about. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I just, I just had one small thing and Cal, you can chime in. Did, we kind of talked about the transition from that public street into the apartment's driveway. Did you just want to do a concrete ramp there or did you want to look Correct, at maybe Brian. doing a mini? Okay. Yeah, just the, the concrete ramp to kind of break that public-private transition up. Okay. Does that, does that work for, for engineering, Brian? Oh, yeah, that's fine. I uh, just want to make sure that everybody's on board. So. Oh. Sounds good. All right. Well, it sounds like the, the things on this can be worked through. So we'll see you back in a couple of weeks. So appreciate the time. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Thank All you. Right. All right, we'll move on to item 11, Foxland, phase 2.5 preliminary plat. Um, Sharon. Uh, yes, if you don't mind, I'd like to go ahead and do, we'll have the preliminary plat and we've got a final plat too. And they're almost identical. It's the same little yeah. section of Foxland Harbor. There's uh, gonna be 13 lots. One of these down here at the number 13 is actually one dedicated to for a single family home. Okay. The others are town townhomes, just like the rest of them, but they're not the, they're actually very good size. They have like three and four bedroom townhomes and two car garages. Um, this one is showing all of the topo on it. That is the preliminary one. And the next one will be the final one. That's the one we'll record. Um, it's pretty much it. They're, see them on the lake front here. Sharon, are these uh, final plat and preliminary plat consistent with the approved FMDP and PMDP for Foxland? Yes, they are. Okay. All right. Thanks, Sharon. Do we have a representative for the applicant wishing to speak? You don't see Joe Godfrey on there anywhere, Josh? There is not a Joe Godfrey showing up in our list. Okay. All right. Well, he emailed us today with his list of questions for everybody, so he's probably got his answers. Okay. Okay. My only my only question is, so lot 13, 
the the rest of what's on that street are I think cottage cottage homes that are there. So because my only question for for Joe, if he was with us, would be why is you know why a single family home, you know, and then going right back to a multifamily product. It's, it's the only thing that sticks out to me being a little odd. Is he, do you guys have any idea? I think it just joins onto Reynard Drive right there and where they, okay. they're going to extend that up into the others. And I think putting the single family just worked out easier, better that way. Okay. Is, does it become a private drive when it goes into into the townhomes? That's going to be a private road, yes. Okay. I see. Okay, that's why. Um, are, are there any any other major concerns or things you guys are working through that we need to be aware of before we bring it back? I don't think so, unless engineering has found it, some, some more things they want to comment on. We, we don't have any issues. We're good. All right. Okay. So, uh, any, any other members of the commission have any questions, concerns, or want to weigh in? Right. Well, seeing none, we'll see it back in a couple of weeks, and that gets us down to item 13, our agenda this evening, Red River Townhomes rezoning with preliminary master development plan. That's a shame. Yes, sir. So this is being presented by Greenland Design. So this is located north of this, the Red River Road Long Hollow Pike split, um, just east of the Gallatin Housing Authority duplexes. So this is a proposed rezoning from R10 to R6 uh, and a proposal for 86 townhomes in the configuration that you can see on the screen there. Uh, the comp plan does support uh, this type of rezoning here and uh, this type of infill in this area of Gallatin. It uh, accomplishes those goals of the comp plan. The architecture they're proposing meets the brick and stone requirements. Some of the issues that we did have though, um, we are requesting a, um, or requiring a sidewalk there along Red River Road, uh, along the development. Um, also, the issue of the two blocks of units that are kind of have their back to Red River Road, kind of if that we, if Planning Commission would like any kind of special uh, orientation or architecture to kind of maybe smooth out that, um, conflict with between those buildings and the public right-of-way um, also there's an issue now with uh, the building code and fire access that if you have this many units you either need to sprinkle them or you need to have two separate entrances so um, we'll just want to hear from the applicant about kind of which direction they want to go with that so thank you Representative for the applicant wants to see if we can answer some of those questions. Sure, this is uh, Andy with Greenland Design. Uh, read through all the comments that staff has. I don't see any issues with us working with staff and, and having something to show Planning Commission on anything that would front uh, Red River Road to have some elevated architecture. Okay. Um, the sidewalks along Red River, actually, that was an oversight. I know better than. And that so they'll be added. Uh, the issue with second connection, the, the best spot for one is to the north. And those properties up there, a couple of them are vacant, you know, where Dustin's got the cursor, mm -hmm. uh, but they are owned by someone else. And, and I have concerns about that street that we would be tied into. I'm not so sure that it would even meet uh, what the fire code would want for a second entrance, actually. Um, so I think that we're going to have to lean towards sprinkling the, the buildings. Okay. And I'll answer any other questions you might have. I think everything else we're, we're pretty well in agreement with on the comments. Okay. And do you do you feel like you'll have some direction on either the second entrance or sprinkling when it when it comes back in a couple of weeks? Uh, most definitely, but I really feel like that. Sprinkling is going to be our option here to uh, to meet the fire code, and it may be the better option to be quite honest with you. Uh, 
Hey, Brian, did we kind of definitively determine that there's not enough room for two entrances off uh, Red River Road based on the on the driveway spacing? Yeah, that's that's not going to work. Um, I wish somebody from the fire department would would have answered our our questions about that though. What they're looking for. Brian, we did hear back from both the fire department and codes on this issue without okay. a second connection that they will require the units to be sprinkled um, or the number of units overall reduced to believe to, I believe it's less than 50 or less than 75. Um, not my area of expertise. We can confirm that final number, uh, Andy, if that's something that your client is willing to entertain but the distance between the separation distance between the access points on Red River Road, um, in order to count, it does have a very definitive separation distance in the fire code. Uh, I don't believe the it's Roosevelt Circle that's to the north. Um, that was not individually looked at, but it is not a, it is better than no access but by no means is that an ideal perfect uh, road. And the development to the west was explored. Um, it is currently <laughs> slated for uh, additional townhome units for Gallatin Housing Authority. Their master, their master plan would have to be revised to move some units out of the way to make any kind of a connection point work between these two developments. So um, long answer is we can continue to work on this issue. Um, but as of right now, the both fire department and building codes are pushing as it's designed for this to be a completely sprinklered uh, development. Okay. Well, and it sounds like that the applicants already head in that direction. So it may not be uh, the big issue when we see it back. So the uh, the overall density for the area going to the R6 and R10, um, can we revisit that? Does that fit into the comp plan and, and for the surrounding areas? Or are we asking for something above and beyond? Yeah, no, it it um, I can pull it up or reference it again for you here, but um, okay. yeah, so this area is. Um, designated as looks like suburban neighborhood revitalization and okay I think okay yeah I remember now so um, if you go to that character area R6 isn't a um, proposed zoning district for that character area but MRO is, and uh, when we looked at the different densities based on what MRO allows and what R6 allows, um, it was basically the same, if, if not a little denser for MRO. Um, so I think what we came to was that because there's R6 basically abutting um, this area uh, to the north, especially, that, that the applicant wanted to uh, submit for R6 so okay so we're so if I, if I understood that correctly the it, the comp plan would support mro zoning so that the density being proposed would you would get it either way essentially but this gives us more continuous zoning in the area by going r6 is that a fair statement exactly exactly yeah but better put than i than i said it okay i i got a question um Please. are the houses like not that one, not the uh, development right there, but the ones in that area, are they also the same R6 or are they less dense, if you know? Yeah, I can pull up the zoning map here just to illustrate. But so you've got R6 basically everywhere to the north. Okay. Um, so it's, you know, it's not too much of a stretch to to see it here in this this location, especially when the density is already allowed with MRO for, for what they're asking for. So. Uh, and then last question I had, are these uh, for sale units, or are these intended to be rented? Um, just saying again, 
the intent is to have homeowner uh, ownership of the each individual units. That's the intent. Now we may have to, you know, I may have to put um, some adjustments on my typical lot layout, but I spoke to the client and the intent is to sell each individual unit separately. All right, sounds good. Does anyone else have any comments? Uh, Councilman Love? Thank you. This is at the, where Lone Hollow and Red River meet, right? One of the worst traffic areas in all of Gallatin. I'm very hesitant to, to be for adding 86 homes, right? Or units, right in that area. So this, that is right, Long Hollow and where Long Hollow and, um, and Red River kind of intersect. Uh, yeah. That's correct. There's that awkward intersection that is almost impossible to get out of. Right. Yeah. Right now without 86 added units. Okay. Brian, can engineering, is there, are there plans for improving that intersection in the future or kind of what's, you know? So as of right now, no, but I should let you know that um, Red River Road there, uh, based on our major thoroughfare plan, is a minor arterial. It is TDOT controlled. Yeah. Most likely this development, because it's over 75 units, which is kind of the threshold that TDOT utilizes for turn lanes, we'll have to put a turn lane in there. One of the comments engineering made on this, uh, before we've seen any kind of traffic impact study, Councilman Love, is that they go ahead and give us a 12-foot right-of-way reservation, so that if we do need to widen or the state needs to widen Highway 25 in the future, there's some adequate space to do so. Um, as far as, you know, the engineering department has looked at putting a roundabout uh, close to where our office is and uh, trying to make that function. Um, right now, that's kind of a, a dream uh, until it gets funded, but uh, we have looked at doing that. That would bring Red River Road and turn it uh, down from the north into that roundabout and hopefully get some of this uh, crazy intersection and stuff solved. But because those are both state route right of ways, uh, that, that's what we're working with. 174 is Long Hollow and 25 is Red River Road and they're both TDOT owned. And and you all that drive that, I I know you know what I'm talking about. It's a very, it's a, it's a bad play. It's a bad intersection already. We, we can't prohibit them again they're they're zone commercial now and which is a fairly intensive uh, zoning on the property and they'd be allowed to develop you can't deny them the right to develop their property so we most likely will have a decrease in intensity or density of, or intensity of as far as trips go uh, along this road we'd be placing the, the the driveway or private street whatever it ends up being uh, essentially as far away as we can uh, and align with the driveway for the Wits barbecue on Highway 25. We don't know when, like Brian mentioned, we don't know when uh, there could be a realignment of the roadways, but it is in our long range plan. Uh, of course, we have a lot of, uh, a few properties, and this might be one of the larger ones in the closer uh, downtown area that are prime or uh, apparently ready for redevelopment. We're going to have others and they're going to generate tra trips to and from Red River Road uh, and, you know, Long Hollow Pike and so forth. And, and keep in mind that the, a lot of the trips on Red River Road and particularly Long Hollow Pike, Red River Road combination are through trips that we believe a lot of those are going to be rerouted uh, with the Albert Gallatin extension. So we should see decreases in trip uh, assignments to uh, through traffic using this road. So it's not ideal. It hadn't been ideal probably forever and since horse and buggy days, but uh, that's kind of how we, we see it, uh, at least at this time. Well, it's right now it's R10 medium de density. R10, okay. 
So uh -huh. you're you're saying that I can't we we can't keep them from developing, but we can keep them from changing the zoning to high density. I mean, I Andy, it's nothing personal for goodness' sake, but you know, it's just I, I don't take it personal, Councilwoman Love. Uh, I believe the zoning is CS though. No, that's next door. Let's see. Uh, it is our, I believe, our. Yeah. So what? What density? So, the, what? What? What level of density would be allowed in the R10 zoning? So, I mean, they, they obviously have the right to put something there. Uh, Ten thousand square foot lots versus uh, six thousand or one for three thousand square feet. Grab something real quick. Yeah, if it's um, R10 would allow with a conditional use multifamily, which would allow one unit per 7,500 square feet of lot area. And if it weren't that, if it went that way. All right. And then R6 allows for what's the, the density allowed under R6? One per 3,000. Okay. It's pretty significant. Maximum dwelling unit size, um, 2,200 square feet per dwelling unit. Excuse me. Minimum lot size required is uh, 6,000 square feet, but that we don't usually see that uh, except for single family, uh, non-attached. With the townhomes, we're seeing like 2,200 square feet and uh, lots as small as 1,500 square feet. But certainly, uh, it's not inappropriate to consider uh, a zoning change like that in the confines of the downtown area. Uh, yes, there are some operational improvement or that would be ideal in that area, but uh, it's not gonna break or make the whole uh, traffic circulation problem in that area, considering the changes that are both on the short-term horizon and long-term horizon. It's trying to get higher densities into the closer into downtown so we don't have them pushed out to the perimeter. Yeah. Well, does this just from what we've seen as we're talking about our the comp plan that's that's being developed going forward where this this type of density would be, you know, or encouraging closer into the city, you know, with the, the draft comp plan we're working with now, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, particularly in the core area of the city. And this is really kind of really on the edge of the core area. Yeah. I, I appreciate it. I, I, I think that the, the statement was made with the, you know, with the hat and track extension to 109 and some of the redevelopment that's coming. I, I, I think we're going to see the, the traffic improve in that area, not get worse. So I'm, you know, well, if we look at from a, a volume, I, I don't know if there's been any level service standard analysis done on the inter, unsignalized intersection at Red River Road and Long Hollow Pike, but by just by looking at daily vo volumes on these roads, particularly Red River Road itself, yeah, they don't come close to approaching the maximum capacity of a roadway of that type. Okay. So uh, we're talking fairly low volumes on the Red River Road section. Granted that many of the trips will turn left and come to the intersection at Long Hollow Pike. But uh, again, again, there are uh, sh uh, short-term and long-term solutions to alleviate those concerns. The traffic may not be that bad now, but we far way farther up on Red River, we're adding thousands of homes and a lot of those people may be going that route in order to get home from downtown Gallatin, which is just gonna make it worse. Well, I, all I can say about that is, is if the city wants to adopt level service standards 
and cumulatively assign those vo traffic volumes from new development to various roadways and intersections. That can be done through a concurrency program. Um, some communities have done those types of things. It's, it's pretty labor intensive, but it can be done, but it would provide a greater assurance that a level of service standard would not be exceeded uh, as a result of new development. So uh, we don't have that yet. And right now, kind of the only thing it seems that we have is that, well, I, it's uncomfortable to me or I don't like it. Uh, that many cars is too many for me or whatever, but, which is very a subjective standard, which is uh, we don't want to apply that. We really want to have a measurable standard to apply that's uh, a, applicable to everyone and not necessarily discriminatory simply because of perceptions of, of use of the roadways or other infrastructure. Councilwoman yeah. Love, if I might, uh, this is Josh. Thank you for, thank you for providing this input. Uh, we will work with the applicant to provide a better understanding of the traffic impacts on Red River Road and ensure that your, we provide um, provide more information as the process goes on so that we all understand cu the cumulative impacts of these. And Bill is making some great points about uh, some long-term things that we'd love to talk to you and the rest of the city council about, but um, not necessarily tonight, live on Facebook in, the, in this meeting um, without more support material given to you. Matt, can I mention something? Uh, by all means, go ahead, Rick. Um, the whole purpose of a long range plan is to have a long range plan and, and the responsibility and the opportunity, Linda, is, is to plan ahead so that we don't get hit between the eyes like we keep getting hit. And it means that we outlay dollars on the front end to have an infrastructure with a planned growth. We cannot stop the growth, but we can manage growth. There's zero that any of us are, have our power to stop growth, can't do it. It, it will never happen. The courts will rule against us every time, but we can manage our growth and manage how it's done but that means having a long range plan and sticking to it. So, you know, this is the third, I don't think the fourth, the third long range thing that, that the city has spent money on and that really haven't followed it. So I, I'm in total uh, sympathy with you and on your side about this, we, we can't stop it. We just have to try and control it and manage it. Uh, I appreciate all the feedback. I think we've given the applicant plenty to uh, to think about in preparation for the next meeting. Um, so we'll let's we'll move on and we'll see this back in a couple of weeks. Well, what we can do, and we can uh, describe what the traffic impact would be if it were to develop under a couple of scenarios under the R10 zoning and what they're proposing and give you an idea of how many additional trips both in the daily and peak hour would be generated between the, the two types of development and where roughly those would be assigned because uh, not all the trips are gonna be signed to the Long Hollow Pike uh, Red River Road intersection. So we, we will get that information to you as well. All right, no, I think that'll be helpful for the discussion. So, all right, we'll move on item 14. Uh, Misby Boulevard, except public improvements, Sharon Burton. Okay, this, now this one is uh, Misby Boulevard. We usually don't have street acceptances on at the work session. A lot of times they're on the consent agendas. Uh, it's actually, you, the Lane Commission just approved them and then the Galton Council, City Council has to actually accept them. Uh, this one is a little bit different because it hasn't been around as long as the actual, we have a couple of things that key in something is okay to approve it. And that's usually 80% uh, built out or it's been four years. Mm -hmm. This one actually just has uh, two lots 
and the capstone assisted living was the main one that uses up when they got their CO the they used up 40 acres of the 46 in the two lots so they're they're being considered to be 80 percent even though they haven't been there for four years yet right. so that's pretty much all this is uh, and this is just for reference. This is the the Young's Nursery property, correct? Yes, with his new assisted living. Yes. Okay, I just get my bearings. Miss B. Or Miss B. All right. All right. Do we have a representative for the applicant that wishes to speak on this? If you are representing this item, if you could use the raise your hand function at the bottom of the screen. Matt, I am not seeing anyone uh, representing this item. And so for just for staff, I mean, are there any any concerns with this or just is it coming to us just because it's it's unusual to have one turn around this quickly? I believe that's essentially it. Uh, right. Engineering had some minor, com minor comments about, I think, drainage grates that may have been resolved by now. And, you know, it is we usually uh, wait several years before acceptance and this one happened to get built all at once uh, and there are vacant properties that are not platted that surround the rest of the of the uh, right of way all right well it's pretty straightforward we'll we'll see anybody else has any other comments we'll see it back in a couple of weeks and we'll move on to item 15 on our agenda all right thank you all right, so item 15 is the Gallatin Industrial Park Phase 4 final plat. Jillian. Yes, uh, next slide, please. The applicant requests approval of a final plat for the Gallatin Industrial Center Phase 4 for an 11 lot plat. This plat is for the Facebook site and the surrounding properties included in that annexation and rezoning from last year. This final plat was already approved by a planning commission uh, last year, but it comes before you today with a minor change. Five additional feet of right of way will be dedicated to the county along Bright's Lane. I have highlighted the area that we are talking about. This is to satisfy a requirement for their county regulations. The planning department, engineering department, and attorney's office are working together to get all of the appropriate notations documented on the plat. But since it is a right of way dedication, it will need to be formally voted on by planning commission at the meeting in two weeks. So we just wanted to bring that in front of you um, is to make, make it is to meet a county requirement along that county road. Okay, but the rest of the final plat is is consistent. Yes, and it was approved uh, earlier this year. Okay, uh, is there a representative for the applicant that wishes to speak on this? This is Brad Simpson with Bark Design Solutions. Uh, I'm here to answer any questions. Uh, again, as Jillian pointed out, it's it's really just to meet the kind of a late request from the county. Uh, we had all the signatures except the county road superintendent and that was something that, that she requested and insisted that be done before she would sign off so we're just trying to um, meet that requirement for her okay well sounds like a housekeeping item that's pretty straightforward does anyone else have any comments they wish to make on it i got a i got one that uh, bride lane extension uh, uh extra right away does that extend all the way to 25 or Hartford Pike? No, sir. It's just along our property from kind of that northern east-west line to the, the southern east-west corner. Um, the properties south of us are still individually owned um, property owners, and we we can't take their property away and, and dedicate that right away. It looked like it would be beneficial to take it all the way to Hartford Pike. But I'm sure, okay. I'm sure that's what the county would like, but we don't have any control over those properties. Okay, you answered my question, so thank you. All right, Sound, sounds good. We'll, we appreciate it, and we'll see it back in a couple of weeks. Um, all right, item 16, which is a update planning commission bylaws. Sounds like a fun one to end the evening on. Yes, this is going to be the highlight of your evening. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Next slide, please, Dustin. 
We had uh, a couple different goals when we started with the update of the Planning Commission bylaws. We wanted the language to reflect the uh, upcoming change from municipal regional to municipal planning commission and update some deadlines that were contained in there to reflect our current six week cycle. Uh, some of the deadlines were still dependent on a four week cycle. And these were some of the minor goals or changes. Next slide, please, Dustin. The major changes, it uh, enumeration or restating of powers designated to the planning commission by TCA. Uh, it would introduce a new tool staff would have to administratively remove items deemed to be incomplete. So that would be items that um, are, are, are so lacking materially that either neither staff could come up with a recommendation or it would be a waste of time for the planning commission to review something. Um, some, something that we hope we probably will never use. But again, mm -hmm. this is still in draft form. It would also establish, the Planning Commission could establish special committees to study and focus on uh, certain areas if there's issues that we're having with, uh, say, lighting. Lighting comes up quite often. The Planning Commission could establish a special committee to study that item. Uh, also, one of the possible changes is with public hearings. It would clarify the length of time each speaker is allotted and it would, in, it would uh, clarify some of the rules of um, the public present, the, the public um, giving their input into projects. It would give the chairman or vice chair acting in the chairman's place a little bit more authority to um, let people know that their time has expired and um, help them find a point at the end of their uh, statement to the Planning Commission. So uh, next slide, please, Dustin. We have the full 10 page document in your agenda. We plan on having this as a discussion item through the May Planning Commission meeting. And we're happy to set up individual meetings with Planning Commission members or city council members as needed to go through some of the ideas and the changes and see if there's anything that uh, we need to fix or clarify just to make sure that the bylaws, uh, we're not trying to govern through the bylaws, but it still gives the planning commission, planning commissioners enough power to be able to make meetings move along in an expeditious manner. Well, I, I read through this earlier today and the, uh, you know, it wasn't quite enough to put me to sleep, but it was, you know, interesting reading a little bit. Um, so I look forward to continuing that conversation. I would encourage everyone to read through, read through this and get familiar with it, uh, especially we get into, I think it was a section, uh, article four, just procedures. It talks a little bit about procedures for making motions um, and how, how to conduct the meetings and, and, to, and, and how that process needs to operate. So uh, I think this would be a good conversation for us to have to ask some clarity about how to run the meetings efficiently and, and fairly for, for the public and for the, for the city. So Josh, do we need to do anything with this as far as discussion this evening or is this just, just to kind of give us the first glance at it? This is an introduction. Uh, we didn't want to just spring this on you and expect you to read all of it and vote on it in a week. We really wanted to make sure that this was an ongoing dialogue to ensure that everyone understood what the intent was and to have multiple eyes on the language to ensure that we're interpreting what our thoughts on paper were effectively. There's a lot of SAT words in that sentence. Yeah. And we, we can include uh, the material that's include if that's the desire of the, the commission to include the material on pages nine and 10 about process and, and uh, sequ sequence of review. And that really is, uh, you know, the steps of general procedures that you have of introducing an item, having the staff do a presentation, then allowing the applicant to do their presentation and then opening it up for public hearing and those types of things. Yep. And, uh, allowing people to speak, uh, 
you know, we've, we've had situations where people want to get up and speak again and well, all I, something else, all that kind of thing. So that may provide a little more structure there. I, and, I, uh, yeah, no, I agree. And I think, I think some of, you know, operating this the zoom virtual environment has had its challenges where the in-person uh it's, it's easier to organize as a meeting but you know having some clarity of when it's appropriate to speak and 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 how often and, and that is is the benefit of everyone so we make sure everyone gets an opportunity to be heard um but not you know but not override a, a meeting or 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 disrupt the business that we're trying to get done so i look forward to diving more into this and I promise I'll actually, I'll read it before the next meeting again. So, all right. Um, other business, is there anything else we need to discuss this evening? No. I do, I heard from the mayor today, uh, the city council is intending to go back to in-person meetings in May. So I know the governor's current executive order expires at the end of the month and rumor is on the street uh, unless something major happens it will be allowed to expire without being renewed so that means we also would be um, obligated to go back to in-person meetings and uh, we'll have a little more information as we go later in the month but the meeting room has changed the Equipment and the technology in the council chambers has been uh, improved along with the acoustics and the overall audio quality. So if when we do go back to in person meetings, we will do uh, one on ones with everyone with your availability to come by, check it out, see how you would interact with it. Um, and just to make sure that all the logistics of the meeting would work well. We don't want to, we don't want to start our planning commission work session in May and have absolutely everything fail on us. Now, let, let me point out also, if you have any questions individually about any items that we either deal with on our agenda or just general items that we're having to deal with, please give me a call. If you want to just discuss those with me and not in a public setting, I'm glad to speak with you about those and the basis and the reasons for why we're taking certain uh, initiatives, I guess, to make recommendations to go a certain direction and maybe not in another way. So be glad to speak with any of y'all about that. Well, I appreciate that, Bill. Um, well, I, for one, am looking forward to seeing everyone in person again. It's been probably right out a year, I think, since we went to this virtual environment. So i uh, Looking forward to seeing everybody again in in-person meetings. So, all right. Um, any other announcements? So, if there's no announcements. Item 19 is to adjourn. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, and have a great evening. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening, and um, we'll see everybody in a couple weeks. Thank you. Everybody, be safe. All right. Bye. Be safe.